title of my, my introduction has a title as well. Um, the title of my introduction is A History of Impurity, which for some time um, also vied as a possible title for the book itself, because I'm really interested in the idea of your impurity, especially in these days when the conversation is all about Swachita and Swachmarat and all the politics of that. Um, so I'm very interested in impurity. So here's the, here's the introduction, and I begin by talking about the image on the, on the cover of the book, which you've all seen. Two women sip wine as they caress one another. All around them is beauty and light. They enjoy the revels with abandon, their jewels sparkling, and look straight at the artist who is putting up their image for posterity. People from around the world will see the image and wonder at its sensuality. An Instagram photo taken in one of the metropolises of the world in the 21st century, you think? No. Try an 18th century painting from rural Rajasthan. I first went to the village of Samod in 2014. We set off from Delhi at the crack of dawn to escape the heavy traffic that builds up after daybreak around the industrial hub of Manisa. It was a hot day in August, and the sun was bright even at 6.30 in the morning. After a five-hour drive, we arrived at a grand hotel in Rajasthan, 40 kilometers north of the state capital, Jaipur. Built as a fort in the 16th century, and then converted into a palace in the early 19th century, Samot Palace is now a heritage hotel. It has a magnificent shish mahal or palace of mirrors, and its Darbar Hall is decorated from floor to ceiling with exquisite paintings. The palace is built in the syncretic Muslim Hindu style of architecture, and the paintings all use vivid pigments. The artwork draws from themes both religious and secular, sensuous images of Krishna and Radha, vie for space with our two women, who in turn rub shoulders with soldiers and sadhus. Desire is of the world, and it extends across what we now term hetero and homosexuality, both of which coexist happily alongside polyamory, Krishna with many gopis, and celibacy, saints with matted hair. I'm fascinated by these multiple versions of desire because these are the desires with which I grew up. All around me in the Delhi of the 1970s and 80s were Hindi films that celebrated same-sex attachments like Anand, older women desiring younger men, Dusra Agni, and cross-couple desire, Angur. Equally, there was Bharatanatyam dance, in which dancers played the parts of both men and women, lover and beloved, Sufi Kavalis that sang of mutual longing between two men, and dotting the landscape were transgender hijas, whom we were taught to respect at all times. In the West, these multiple desires are greeted as newfangled ideas. And in India now, they are increasingly treated as foreign conspiracies. It was only after returning from 18 years of studying and working in the US that I was able to realize the complexity of this landscape of desire. When I first decided to move back to Delhi, friends and colleagues asked me how I would continue my work on queer theory in a country that was becoming increasingly puritanical and sexually violent. The pub attacks in Bangalore on Valentine's Day had already happened, reports of rape were on the rise, and misogyny was getting institutionalized. Homosexuality had always been outlawed under an outmoded British law and was soon to be recriminalized after a brief reprieve. Luckily, as we all know, it's now decriminalized. But despite the scant academic presence of sexuality studies in the form of syllabi, centers, and university departments, India has a lived relation to desire that makes it much easier to speak about various desires to a wider audience. Millions of people know the stories of cross-dressing gods. Men hold hands freely. Women frequently sleep in the same bed. This is a country that is deeply homophilic, even as it is often superficially homophobic. The intellectual and cultural histories of desire are both broad and deep. Here, desire is not just, or even primarily, an academic subject. I soon realized that my interest in desire, my desire for desire, was not a consequence of my work in the US. Rather, my work on desire was a consequence of the fact that I had grown up in India. Because desire here is everywhere. I dare say that is true all over the world. But both the restrictions and the permissions seem to be more intense here. What is considered taboo in the US, heterosexual men sharing the same bed, for instance, passes here without comment. And what elicits no reaction in other places, the length of one's hair, for instance, 
is intensely policed and debated here. In India, even a law against homosexuality does not prevent a simultaneous law supporting transsexuality. Consistency is not the favored mode in India, especially in relation to desire. We have very strict rules about what must be done. Heterosexual marriage and producing children are flourishing businesses. But equally, we have long histories that valorize celibacy and goddesses who model childlessness. So which one is the real India? The answer, fortunately for us, is all of the above. The history of desire in India reveals not purity, but impurity as a way of life. Not one answer, but many. Not a single history, but multiple tales cutting across laws and boundaries. So this is just sort of first couple of pages of the book, and just to sort of situate where I come from and the sort of the multiple things I found to write. Uh, thank you for that uh, very very eloquent section, but you didn't read two of my favorite lines. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. She's a hard task mistress, I tell you. Mistress, master, <laughs> yes. yeah. master mistress of my passion. <laughs> In the, well, the two lines that I really like, one is, well, one line is kind of expressive of the book where you say, I cannot provide a definition of desire mm -hmm. because it is precisely the thing that elides definition. Mm -hmm. And another very elegantly crafted line that says, across its multiple definitions, desire is related to a shiver of pleasure, a shock of pain, and an intensity of recognition. Now just to carry on uh, you know, with this very idea, because what the book does is it takes precisely this, that you know, what she said and what I just read, through different sites, locations, and spaces, mm -hmm. and talk about you know, how desire is embodied in that space or location or site. Um, you talked about Hindi films and um, <coughs> you know, uh, films like Anand and all these very transgressive stories. The other thing that you say, uh, which is actually very correct, which is uh, that Bombay cinema's desire has always been expressed more through indirection than uh, explicitness. And in a chapter called Zero, which has nothing to do with Shah Rukh Khan's new release, <laughs> um, even the Madhuri probably would have liked I would have loved Shah Rukh to have been here. Yes. I've mentioned him once, and I mentioned another movie. So uh, you, you talk about fractions, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting thing. And then has a very interesting discussion about the film Deirish mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether you could just share a little bit of your reading about that film. Yeah. I mean, you've asked me 20 questions in one, which is, which is you know, how to talk. Stay, 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 uh, stay with Deirish Kia. Deirish Kia, okay. <laughs> um, the, you know, I have sort of two chapters with very mathematical writers. And as my friends in the audience who study mathematics will know, I have zero mathematical ability. So it's sort of funny to me that I have to talk about zero and fractions um, because I'm not mathematically inclined. But what fascinates me about um, this language of numbers is that even without realizing it, we think about desire in relation to numbers or in terms of numbers. So we think most often, for instance, of the couple, right? The group, the uh, When you say you're single, you mean you know, you're alone by yourself. Um, and these two are the most sort of accepted forms of desire. So we don't really necessarily talk about threesomes or orgies or foursomes or fivesomes. So there, there seems to be a limited number of numbers that we want to associate with, with desire, which I think is interesting. Um, and my, my um, interest in numbers came actually um, not from Deirish here, but from an old Greek myth that, that Plato talks about in this classic, very extremely different work called the Symposium, where he, you know, people are gathered around much like we are here, and people are saying, let's talk about what love is. And um, as Vahidis, one of the participants says, I know what love is. Um, it's about people who have been separated. And in his worldview, all human beings were one point or the other double. So everyone had two heads, four arms, four legs. And then the gods, um, you know, the, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, the Hindu gods are just all fabulous in how um, jealous and capricious and revenge, vengeful they are. The gods got very upset that the human beings were so powerful and so decided to cut them down to size. I mean, that's where our faith comes from. So cut these double beings in half. And so ever since then, according to the legend, um, every each half is searching for its other half. And that's where even now our phrase of my better half or my other half comes from. 
Because the idea is that we're looking for this other half that will make ourselves whole, except that means one entity is looking for another entity, both of whom are described as half entities. They come together, uh, the two entities coming together, but they form one unit. So it's sort of a very interesting game of numbers between halves and ones and twos. Um, and what I found fascinating about a film like Dalish Kia, have you all seen it? And if you haven't, you're, let me assure you, your time is much better spent seeing that than being here. So either you can leave now or right after this, you've got to go watch Dalish Kia. What fascinated me about Dalish Kia was precisely that title, right? What is day? I mean, you know, how can you have one and a half? loves. And so what it reminded me of this idea of halfness and ones and twos. And what's fascinating about that uh, that film, as you know, and those of you who haven't watched the film, please cover your ears because I, I now have to issue what's know. called a spoiler alert. Yeah, you should right? go ahead because otherwise you won't get to the point. Okay. So, <laughs> <day -ish. laughs> so the, the thing about Dalish yeah, is that it is a love story between two women, but that we don't know that until we get to the end of the film, because we are so trained in our heterosexist ways of looking for a romance between a man and a woman. <coughs> and we are given the hint of that romance, which we fall for hook, line, and sinker, and we ignore the two women altogether until it comes to the end of the film. And so what's fascinating to me about the sort of lesbian desire in that film is that it takes place in the crevices between one and two. That you don't see it fully, but you do see it, you just don't know how to notate it or annotate it. And so that idea of desire as not existing in numbers or words or ideas that are clearly visible to us, that are clearly recognizable to us, to me is what is fascinating. Because we live with those desires on a daily basis, an everyday basis. And what's fascinating is that we're encouraged to see some of them as desires and discouraged from seeing others as being any kind of viable form of desire. So for me, in the numbers game, the halfness of desire, both more than one, but less than two. It's what is fascinating because then it's both excessive but not adding up. It doesn't add up to something that we can recognize because to me that's important. Um, the desire is not something that is always going to be neat and clean. So and it's, like it's like Tyler Shepherd. It's like Tyler Shepherd. Exactly. Exactly. Which is also there in her. It's also there. It's also in the book. Right. So, well, the. Um, uh, you, you were very nice about not revealing too much and about the film. Yes, yeah. because it's also very kind of the half and all that. Yeah, right. And uh, the interesting thing I, I remembered when I was you know, re uh, reading this book again for this conversation is that the character of Madhuri Dixit is called Begum Para, and Begum Para used to be a big star in the 1940s and 50s. She was a big star in the 1940s and 50s, and uh, she died in 2008, and the last film that she ever acted in was Sanjay Leela Bhansali Samaria. Oh, okay. 50 years after she had retired, you know, he had persuaded her to come and act in that film. And what is interesting about Begum Para is that uh, she became very famous during her time, not because she was a top actress, but also because James uh, Burke, this very famous photographer, did a series of photographs of her in Life magazine. And during that time, in the film industry and in the gossip circles and the film magazines, there was constantly this conversation of there were all these daring pin ups and blow ups of Vega Para, and constantly this conversation about her multiple sexual lives and her desires, and also uh, her lesbian relationship with a sister in law mm -hmm. called Parunita Das Gupta. So, Vega Para uh, kind of always had in the star mm -hmm. image of hers. The subterranean idea of the lesbian relationship. And it's interesting that uh, Mark Dixit should be named as Begum Para in, yeah. in, in uh, the Irish yeah. One of the, my most uh, favorite chapters in the book, because it's so, uh, I and mean, it's not something that we talk about very much when we talk about desire, is the chapter on celibacy. Because, I mean, one of the things that Madhvi argues is that. You know, celibacy not only allows women to escape this whole regime of uh, sexual reproduction, but also even among those of us who work in areas of sexuality, there is this whole thing about somebody who doesn't have a lover or doesn't have what we understand to be a sex life as either being a prude or conservative or somehow not being able to make it or having graduated from high school, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> So everyone in high school has a sex life, right? <laughs> so, so the 
this is precisely. You know, we all say everybody has a sex life. You know, but there are some people who may choose not to have it. Right. And I think one of the things that you very beautifully argue is that uh, you know the intensity that you find in sexual desire may actually, like you said, intensity may still exist in a relationship where there has been a renunciation of sex. So I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about uh, yeah. celibacy. Yes, yeah. I mean this is actually tied to the first part of your first question, which is about desire, right? What do I mean by desire? What do I understand? Where do you by find desire? desire? Where do I find desire? Exactly. And um, I mean it was it was important for me to have desire in the title rather than say sex or love because I think those two terms have very different connotations. Yeah. Um, love as a word I don't like at all. I think it's entirely too sentimental. It can be captured too much as, you know, sort of in Valentine's Day cards and hearts. And but you told me you love Tarot Yeah, but that's a different kind of love. That's like Tarot and me. Don't tell my secrets. Um, so I don't like the word love. And the word sex, um, and, and this is something, you know, we can talk more about, is fun, but it tends to be limited in our vocabularies, both imaginative and spoken, to um, <coughs> genital physical acts, uh, which then get tied to specific bodies and you know so on and so forth and lead to certain sexual identities. But desire to me is a term that does not necessarily need to be rooted in the body. And for me, that's very important because as I said, even with this idea of fractions and numbers, that's not necessarily rooted in the body, but it is an idea that nonetheless deeply affects the way in which we think about desire. So, and, and as you as you know, I have you know chapters on pan, I have chapters on law, um, I have chapters on psychoanalysis, and now none of that actually deals with the specificity of a body, but has to do with desire and everything that affects it. And I think one of the things I'm doing with this book um, is trying to think about how every the everydayness of our lives is saturated. With these ideas of desire, you know how we desire to uh, how we decide to grow our hair, what makeup we decide to put, how we decide to speak, what grammar, what grammatical languages we speak, and so on and so forth. And so when I started to think about desire, to me, celibacy is an absolutely intricate part of desire. Um, not because it means sexuality or genital sexuality, because it doesn't, but precisely because it gives us or allows us to think about desire in ways that are not often thought about. Now, celibacy, as you rightly said, is often, um, is either, one of two things marks our attitude to celibacy. One is veneration, right? So religious celibates, we sort of say, oh, these are people who have exceeded the physical realm and they actually don't care about sex so much any longer. And so they are ones who are to be venerated and respected. And we have sort of mythological religious tales that are littered with people like this, celibates like this. On the other hand, we have the kind of celibates that you're talking about, which is, you know, people who are seen as losers, who don't want to have sex, who are not interested in um, having a sex life and this, that, and the other. And for me, what's fascinating about celibacy, historically, as well as in the present day, is that far from, my, to my mind, far from being an escape from desire, <laughs> it seems to me that celibacy is an escape from the constraints that is put upon us by sexuality. So celibacy suggests that desire is very clearly not rooted only in genital sexuality. That we might have a deep desire to do things with our libidos and with our reflexes and with our wants and needs and longings that don't have anything to do with the body or with sex, in that sense of the word. And so um, historically what I found, and it's in the chapter, is that a lot of um, celibates in, in India, in the Indian subcontinent, have been women. And for a lot of them, this is the only route through which to escape heterosexual marriage and reproduction, right? So the minute you say, um, I'm not interested in men, and it has to be rooted through God, right? So the minute you say, I'm interested in God rather than men, people can't really say to you, oh, forget that, right? Because you sort of, you are holding them to a, to a higher purpose or a higher ground. Um, and so, and the Sufis are excellent at this, right? Because they are constantly blurring that boundary between a desire for God and a desire for a beloved. And women historically have always um, played at that fault line or made that fault line work for them. To say, I'm not interested in sex with a human being because I'm interested my, in my entire body. Think of Mirabai, for instance. My entire body is given over to God. And Mirabai, you remember, married to a Scion, the prince of 
um, uh, Rob Rajasthan and Principality. I mean, you know, the, the echoes from uh, Padmavat, uh, Padmavati are quite intense. And goes out onto the street singing and dancing, and all the Rajputs are horrified. They say, you know, our women don't do this. Doesn't have sex with her husband and um, runs away from home and eventually merges, so the story goes, into the idol of Krishna. So there's a way in which historically for women, celibacy has always been a way out of an unhappy marriage or an undesirable liaison with a man um, that they could not enforce any other way. And so whether these women were lesbians, whether they were bisexual, whether they were just not interested, whether they just had headaches, whatever it was, the fact of the matter is that celibacy has a very deep-rooted relation to desire. And it is a relationship that, it, that challenges our understanding of desire as being about genital consummation or sexual consummation. And so for me, it's very important to think about that, especially from a feminist viewpoint, in which you know women increasingly um, Sort of that is their root for them to say, you know, I'm I'm religiously oriented. So for me, celibacy is just fascinating from that point. Yeah, and and Mirabai is a very interesting example because mm -hmm. the different iterations of Mirabai, yeah. it's also this whole relationship with Krishna is also very very erotic. Yeah. In fact, uh, one of my famous, uh, one of my favorite Amanchitra Kathas is the one on Mirabai because of the artist uh, actually seemed to get the idea mm -hmm. really well and. Uh, uh, and also the very you know the different kinds of films, but there's uh, and there is another story about Mirabai that you uh, narrate later on mm -hmm. uh, about when she you uh, you talk about her going to Mathura, right? Uh, and the priest stopping her, priest stopping her. So uh, that story I know a little differently, uh -huh. which is that uh, it's a story connected with Guruji uh, Goswami, who is also a Krishna bhakt. And uh, Meera wants to go and meet him. Mm. And she, of course, travels everywhere trying to meet all these Krishna huts. So finally goes to Vrindavan and finds Rupa Goswami's hashed hut. So she tells the Rupa Goswami's shishyas, go and tell him that I want to see him. Meera Bai has come. And the shishya says, you can't go here. His Guruji does not set eyes on any woman. Mm. So then she says, who is a man? Who is a woman? The only Purush I know is Krishna. And all his devotees are women. And uh, so, you know, there's no uh, flexibility in the, in the, in the entire Vajra tradition. Uh, for instance, the uh, filmmaker Ritu Parna Ghosh was deeply inspired by this. Yeah. You know, and even if you look at some of his own, what we call the queer personas in, in film, actually draws a lot from the idea of the Vajra. Mm -hmm. that in the same body, you know, you can be, you can be so many things. Yeah. And that is actually very much a part of your book. I mean, in both Bhakti and Sufi poetry, this is a common strand. Yeah. You know, the idea that um, the devotee, well, you know, I mean, from some points of view, it is a, it's a sexist idea, but it's also interesting, um, which is that the devotee is always female. And it doesn't matter whether the devotee is biologically gendered male or female, all um, devotees of Krishna, all devotees of Anna are going to be um, gendered female. And so, uh, Bulesha will talk, write about himself as someone dressed as a woman uh, in relation to Shainayat and in relation to God. Um, so all these, so all these uh, various narratives, and you know, I have a story here about the Nawabs of Awadh who addresses women um, on all the saint days of the um, of their you know their sort of reigning their reigning deities, their reigning peers, and would sort of pretend to be women in childbirth. Giving birth to to their to their feet and dressed as women would sort of go through labor pains and all that and then and this was the Nawab it was not just sort of somebody enacting a play form play poem so this was a very serious matter and it was a matter that was considered as being a high matter right that people who were serious took gender less seriously than others did and it was people who in fact were not serious. Emotionally, intellectually, religiously, sexually, who are perhaps more attached to gender. And that to me is just a fascinating reversal of what we think of today. You know, the sexism that you talked about, you actually combat it very interestingly in the book mm -hmm. uh, by saying that in your psychoanalysis chapter, yeah. Yeah. because you say that, you know, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, this whole idea of the castration mm -hmm. doesn't work in the same way. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that because that then gives a kind of a counter. To this idea of yeah. the, the, the feminization of 
the devotees of Krishna as. Shall I just read a couple of pages? Sure, sure. Right so right right. This chapter. Okay, yes. This is just the beginning of it. And, you know, as Shoni said it at the start, uh, this book has 22 chapters, but they're all really short. And so I don't think we're going to give you an exhaustive sense of it, uh, because then, of course, that would not drive book sales, and my editor Ravi would be most upset with me. So this is just to give you a taste of taste of what's going on. This is a taste of the psychoanalysis chapter. Right? One day, almost a hundred years ago, a significant disagreement arose between the founder of the Indian Psychoanalytic Society, Girinder Shekhar Bose, and the founder of psychoanalysis in the West, Sigmund Freud. In a letter dated 11th April 1929, G. Bose wrote to S. Freud to point out. What he thought was a difference between the castration threat posed by the Oedipus complex in the West and in India. <coughs> quoting from his letter. I do not deny the importance of the castration threat in European cases. My argument is that the threat owes its efficiency to its connection with the wish to be female. The real struggle lies between the desire to be a male and its opposite, the desire to be a female. I have already referred to the fact that the castration threat is very common in Indian society, but my Indian patients do not exhibit castration symptoms to such a marked degree as my European cases. The desire to be a female is more easily unearthed in Indian male patients than in European, unquote. The Oedipus complex, often considered the cornerstone of Freudian psychoanalysis, describes a scenario in which the little boy is threatened with serious consequences if he does not forego sexual interest in his mother. If he disobeys, if he continues to express a sexual interest in his mother, then his punishment is castration. For Freud, the successful negotiation of the Oedipus complex, i.e. giving up sexual interest in the mother, is the pathway to masculine heterosexuality. The child has been warned that if he does not give up the mother, then he will become a woman like the mother. Male heterosexuality sexuality will henceforth consider castration as the biggest threat to its masculinity. And accordingly, it will guard its masculinity by attacking femininity with the violence that had once been psychically wielded against it. The move to becoming a man has to take a decisive turn away from the woman. In Freudian psychoanalysis, this complex psychic negotiation takes place in boys between the ages of three and five. According to both, Indian men do not fear becoming women, so the threat of the Oedipus complex is not as strong. They do not display the same fear of castration as their Western counterparts. Both insists that Indian men have a deep psychic memory, reinforced by religion and mythology, of the easy interchangeability of male and female bodies. What's more, these stories about men who become women are often accompanied by narratives of greater rather than diminished sexual prowess. The reduced presence of the castration anxiety in Indian men, then, is because there is something attractive rather than threatening for a man about the possibility of becoming a woman. Freud was clearly curious about Bose's local flavoring of the Oedipus complex, especially because for him, too, the Oedipus complex is characterized by a boy's attraction towards the possibility of becoming a woman. It is the sheer attractiveness of being the same as one's mother that needs to be overcome. The trauma of moving away from the desire to be a woman is great precisely because the attraction too has been great. But in Freud's world, if a man wants to be a woman after the Oedipus phase is over, then he is greeted with horror and painted with shame. This is why male homosexuality, in its turn away from Oedipal masculinity, has had such a long and troubled reception in the Judeo-Christian world. Freud was curious, but couldn't afford to be too curious about Bose's theory, because that would affect the universality he had claimed for his idea of male heterosexual development. Nonetheless, with or without Freud's imprimatur, Bose's ideas about the attractiveness of castration to the grown and not necessarily homosexual Indian man is a radical chapter in the history of desire in the West. Excellent. And, um, and you know, and I go on to, to sort of outline these histories a little bit and to outline the fact that we have such a great comfort um, with, for instance, you know, the myth of Mohini, which is Vishnu dressed as a woman. In fact, a lot of what we consider Hindu myths these days would not have come to being if Vishnu was not dressed as Mohini. 
I mean, they're sort of the extremely central myths, which brings me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. You know where? No, actually. <laughs> no, I think that I, you know, one of the most uh, valuable chapters over here is actually on the Ayat Oh, great. And since everybody's talking about Shabrimala, the, uh, you know, the, the verdict has, you know, uh, been so, uh, so controversial, and it seems to be, at some level, a very simple idea. Why shouldn't women be allowed to enter the temple? And you have complicated the debate mm -hmm. uh, by giving us a history of it in a very interesting way. And I'd like you to share that with our audience today. I promise I have no idea that the Supreme Court would be passing this judgment on Shabrimala when I wrote this chapter in the book. Um, I wrote this chapter because um, Ayyappan and the entire sort of myths around Ayyappan played a, a big role in my life as I was, as I was growing up. Um, and, you know, the, talking about Ayyappan actually brings together a lot of the questions we've been talking about because it brings together the idea of celibacy, right? The, everyone says Ayyappan is a celibate, celibate god, which is why he cannot have um, sexually active women around him. And, you know, and we, can, we can think about that for a second. Brings together the idea of celibacy, of misogyny, of course. Um, and of this idea of, you know, what is this relationship between maleness, femaleness, godliness, and, and all that stuff in, in our history. Um, what fascinates me about Ayyappan, and, and all we have, and I, I hope I'm not offending anyone by saying so, um, all we have about all our gods are stories. And all the stories we have around Ayyappan um, are stories that are deeply and intensely homosocial. It's all stories about men, uh, but there isn't a whiff of misogyny in any of them. So this importation of misogyny into the homosocial world of Ayyappan is brand new. It's something that we have done all by ourselves um, and, and all by sort of, you know, the sort of priestly, Brahminical male class in, in Shabarimala. But just sort of briefly, um, all the, um, as I said, we're talking about that, so that's why you brought up, right? So um, Ayyappan is the son of two men. He's the son of Shiva and Vishnu. And uh, Vishnu is in drag as Mohini, but Shiva knows very well that she is Vishnu. So there's no there is no uh, delusion or anything going on, right? So it's not Shiva saying, oh, that woman is very sexy and I want to have sex with her. Shiva saying, oh, Vishnu, can you please wear those clothes that you wore the other night because I find you really sexy in them. And then let's, you know, go for it. And so there are various versions of this tale of Shiva and Vishnu coming together and they are all intensely erotic, intensely. But, you know, a thousand different versions of this. Ayyappan is the product, the offspring, of one of these sexual encounters between Shiva and Vishnu. So he's the son of two men. The son of two men, um, his best friend is this Muslim pirate called Babar. And they are in fact so inseparable that uh, Ayyappan tells his father, you have to treat Babar as though he were me, another me. Right? And again, like Dei Rishkiya, I think it's very clear for us to read the romantic overtones of this. But of course, we can choose not to as well. So, son of two men, um, boyfriend, lover, best friend, comrade of another man, who he is so close to that you have to, in fact, stop at the shrine of Baba before you go on to Shabrimala to worship Ayyappan. And again, in this day and age, especially in the last four and a half years, as we know, the fact that a Muslim shrine and a Hindu temple are inextricably linked together, I think is a very important thing for us to uh, keep in mind. So that's the second version of the story. And the third part of this puzzle that I find fascinating is that one story around Ayyappan goes that he goes up to heaven to hang out with the rest of the gods. Um, he's the son of Shiva and Vishnu, two of the most powerful gods in the pantheon. And so he rises soon, right? And you know, the gods are also nepotistic and you know, all that stuff. He rises soon in the ranks. And the other gods start getting very jealous, right? Remember what I said about Greek gods and Hindu gods and all that. We get very jealous and say, my God, Ayyappan is going to uh, unseat all of us because Ayyappan comes up with this plan that leaves the other gods promised. So he says, apparently, I have a great idea. Let's get rid of death. Fine, so far so good. And part B of that plan is, let's also get rid of birth. Because after all, one gets birth because one fears one will die. But if we are not going to die, we don't want to share anything with anybody, right? So let's just live forever and not have children. And the other gods say, oh my god, half the stuff that comes our way is for people who want children. 
or people who don't want to die. So he's taking away all our resources and revenues, right? It's like an income tax rate or whatever. <laughs> and so they send Narada to Ayapa to steer him off course. So Narada goes to Ayapa and says, I have one question for you, you know, it's really been bothering me. So Ayapa says, What is it? Narada says, I just want to know how are you related to the wives of your father and your mother? So Ayapa starts thinking about this. Now, on the one hand, maybe he can say about Shiva, Samsar, Parvati, which is my father's wife, therefore my stepmother, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, Shiva and Parvati are also sort of Arjuna Rishwara, so you know, they're both also the same, the half and the one and this, that and the other. But he can't figure out what to do with um, Vishnu's partner. Is Vishnu the mother who has a wife? The father who is sometimes the mother who has a wife? Um, the father who is the husband of the father, or the mother who is the wife of the father who has been, so he can't figure it out. And the story goes is that he's so deep in thought that he comes back down to Shabrimala, and to this day he's there because he can't figure out how he is related to his second father's wife, or his mother's wife. And so this then you get some sense of the lie of the land here, that it's heavily populated by men and men alone. So there is never any fragment that says that this homosocial unit, perhaps homosexual, we don't know, but certainly homosocial unit, is built on misogyny. It isn't, right? One of the shrines next to Shabrimala, Ayapan's shrine in Shabrimala also says, is also uh, this woman who wants to marry him. And Ayapan says, I'll tell you what, I'll marry you the year that no new devotee comes to see me. Which of course is never, right? He's a polite guy, so saying politely, never. And her shrine is right there, and clearly she's sexually active, which is why she wants to marry him. So there is already an idol of a sexually active woman between the ages of 10 and 50 there. And that's also part of the ritual of the day. Exactly, that you have to go there and show that in fact you're a new deity. Sorry, Shoini's name has been moved by that revelation. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> gotcha, we'll be thinking around. Exactly. So, there, so, there, I, so I have really no idea where this is coming from. And there was a bizarre and absurd, I think you read, you must have read it, I hope you didn't, um, editorial piece by general, National General Secretary of the BJP, saying not allowing women into the into Shabrimala is a harmless tradition. That's why his words. Begging the question of course, whose tradition, when, why, where, and harmless, harmless to whom? You know, so, so this is this kind of routinizing of misogyny. When there is no whiff of it in the people in whose name you are instituting it, it's simply absurd to me. Um, so I'm glad the Supreme Court is, you know, is persistent. And let's, so I actually don't know, have any women between the ages of 10 and 50 gone into the temple yet? Not really, no, still not gone in, right? So, shows you. I think the Supreme Court bought some time by saying, we <coughs> start hearing this, the reviews, um, on January 23rd, hoping that some women will go in and then the group are all But done. your uh, point of view will probably be fought by people on both sides, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No one wants Ayapan to be gay. And and uh, and uh, no one wants uh, no one wants to think. So those people also don't want to hear my point of view. So one of the interesting things about the book. And at some point, you say this as well, uh, and I would like you to talk a little uh, bit about that, is how you have talked about desire as being in excess of identities. And I say this because we live in times where identities are getting more and more rigid. And, uh, and desires are getting attached to identities. And whereas here you say, that the desires are so multiple, so diverse, so unruly, mm -hmm. so uncontrollable, that they can actually attach themselves to anything, mm -hmm. which then completely invites us to rethink our idea of the identity. Mm -hmm. well, I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, I fear that that might be another losing battle, but you know, I'm used to fighting losing battles, so I'm gonna fight it anyway. Um, again, we talked about this a little bit earlier about how, for me, desire, but well, not just for me, for all of us, um, desire is not necessarily located only or even primarily in a body. Right? That there are ideas that influence our desire that um, that vary from across regions, languages, um, all kinds of notions affecting the way we are in the world. And if we just go back again to sort of mythologies and traditions, 
Um, you use the word embodied, and I'll talk about that in the introduction. Actually, embodiment is the furthest thing from desire, historically and mythologically, in the Indic subcontinent that you can think of. So if you think of um, Vedic traditions, for instance, um, Kama, the god of desire, is bodiless. He's burnt to cinders by Shiva for daring to disturb him. And then Parvati says, please, please, please bring him back to life. And Shiva says, okay, I'll bring him back to life, but I won't give him a body. So the god of desire in Vedic mythology is disembodied. There is no body to come. And in Sufi tradition, the entire sense of I am desiring this body in front of me, which is also existing on a realm that I cannot see, suggests that this body is not the be all and end all of desire. So to think about desire as embodied actually is the weirdness. But it's got so much political cachet, it's got so much social backing, because it provides us with an easy answer. That if you look like this, then your desire is this, then your sexual orientation is this, and then you have to stay within that little bastard. But, you know, we all, as we all know again, and this is a very routine, prosaic, um, commonsensical uh, piece of knowledge, is that our desires vary. They fluctuate between not just day to day, but from morning to evening, or from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. So what is it that encourages us to narrate our desire as being fixed and fixable? As being boiled down to a particular gendered identity, to a particular gendered body that will look a particular way, and that will therefore have a certain sexual orientation. Unfortunately, though, there is so much, there are so much resources being thrown at that particular version of sexual identity that I think we stand a very little chance of actually going back and allowing ourselves to be surprised. Because I think actually the one word I would use in relation to desire is the word surprise. If we're not surprised by our desires, then you know half the fun is lost. But it seems to me we are doing everything we possibly can to insulate ourselves from being surprised. We want to know in advance the answer to all these questions. What is my gender? What is my sexuality? What is my orientation? To whom am I attracted? And then if we change our mind or if we see someone else changing our mind, we come down on them and on ourselves very, very harshly, very sharply. So of course we have to ask ourselves, why are we so invested? in having these particular identities, and as I said, a very clear and easy answer to that is because there is legal, economic, social, cultural backing for that kind of simplicity and neatness. Desire, as I said, is messy and impure. So to think about it in terms of neatness is to militate against the very subject that we're thinking about. And so identities increasingly, proliferatingly, are becoming the name of the day people speaking as a X or as a Y um, come to dominate the scene and people who are in the interstices, in the daily part of it or the Thai part of it, are being lost literally in the cracks. But that's where our desire is. And that's what I would like to encourage all of us to really take more seriously. I'm a little more optimistic than you wrote for this. That's our dynamic. So between the two of us, we've got all the bases covered. So, uh, yes, I think that is the wonderfulness of this book, is that you actually show that we have a long tradition mm -hmm. of uh, not having to actually invest in identities, that, uh, that you know, there is a whole history by which we can look at embodiment, desire, uh, and all that in a much more complex way. So while the subtitle of your book is A History of Desire in India, mm -hmm. by the time we reach the book, as you yourself say, that both these categories become endlessly unstable. Mm -hmm. And even India, right. when you talk about how the contours of India keep changing, because when we talk about India, we actually think about the post-1947 uh, India, but there was an India before that. And, uh, and all the stories that are collected in this book, uh, in this volume, are actually about all those, all those Indias. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I thought I could just ask you to speak a little bit about your first chapter and then we will throw it open uh, you know, for a conversation. Maybe talk a little bit about um, the Dargahs, you know, because we are in a city of Dargahs and uh, Dargahs are also sites of desires because usually we go there with some desire or the other. But there is also a story of desire that is inextricable from the Dargah and which is about the peel and the movie. And that also is relevant for us at a time when 
the whole idea of the teacher-student relationship uh, is becoming deeply contested. So perhaps that's also something that you know we need to be reminded of. Mm -hmm. So if you can talk a little bit about that, and then we can throw it open to the audience. Mm -hmm. I'll just say before I answer this question that all comments and queries addressed to Shoni Ghosh, please, after this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my first chapter actually was going to be on Delhi. And I, and I wrote, wrote that entire chapter, I loved it, I still love it, but I had to throw it away because it just wasn't fitting on. But in many ways, the Dargah's chapter is my Delhi chapter because as you say, um, Delhi is dotted with all kinds of Dargah's. Um, but even more than, I, I speak uh, specifically about the Jamali Kamali tomb in, in this chapter, but even more than a specific tomb, I think it's the idea of the Dargah that I find fascinating. Because again, to go back to the Ayyappan story, um, it's about two men being buried side by side, which fulfills, of course, every romantic trope that we know about, you know, Janam Janam Ka Saaf, this idea of that you'll be together in life and death, uh, that you're going to be sort of uh, sent into the, into the hereafter together, not separated. Um, and what's fascinating to me is that in the Dargahs, these the two men buried together are always um, teacher and disciple, always Peer and Mali. Um, and and as often happens, the uh, the teacher dies first. But clearly, there is so much acceptability and understanding among his followers that he wants this particular disciple buried next to him. That after the disciple dies, he is in fact buried next to him. So there isn't any sort of oh now the teacher is dead, I can sidestep his wishes. So um, so it, it's very much and the Jamali Kamali tomb is known as the Gay Taj Mahal. Uh, because you know it's two men buried together, but along the same lines as the Taj Mahal has is commemorating this kind of heterosexual love. What's fascinating to me about these dargahs is that certainly predates this kind of uh, this kind of ferment in which we are living. The, the sort of Me Too moment, the Me Too movement, uh, specifically as it attaches to universities, specifically as it attaches to spaces of learning. Um, and I have, as you know, an entire chapter on education in this book as well, in which I make the same point, um, which is that the idea of education in various and varied traditions around the world is absolutely and utterly inseparable from desire. That you cannot have an educational setting or purpose without it being infused with a strong dose of desire. Now, certainly, we can all be agreed that there have to be certain limits placed on that, that we all recognize where those limits are. And those limits are different for different people. But we're not even, you know, we're not even talking about all that in this book. In this book, this idea that de desire is what makes your thirst for knowledge grow. That because you love your teacher in a certain way, you love the knowledge that she or he is giving to you. And so there is, and so in all these tales of education and all these tales around the Dargas, it's always around poetry, for instance. Always around what these people are saying intellectually. And we need to remind ourselves over and over again that the brain too is an organ. And it is a very sexual organ that we have in our body. And we are so hung up on thinking about sex as genital that we completely forget the brainy part of sex or the brainy part of desire. And for me, the Dargas commemorate, enshrine this relationship of knowledge dissemination, of knowledge of the thirst for knowledge and knowledge production as being extremely um, divine, as being sort of, they elevate it to a stage that's absolutely wonderful. And what's wonderful about the Jamali Kamali tomb in particular, and if you haven't been to it in Nairobi, please go to it again at once. First watch Deirishkiya, then go to Jamali Kamali. Um, you're going away with a lot of homework. <laughs> exactly. So it has, it's, it's a tomb, it's a dargah that is of course under lock and key, our wonderful archaeological society of India is locked. So you can't actually go in. Um, but it's a flat roof structure. But when you peer into it, you can see it's actually a dome on the inside. And so what I love about it architecturally, this is what I was saying about design not being only bodily, architecturally also it's hermaphroditic. That it is sort of a, a different thing outside, a different thing inside. And the graves of um, the Sufis were always marked as male or female. So if you if it was a female grave, it would be a flat top to mark the piece of paper on which the sage would write. And if it's a male grave, it would be a marked with a pencil box to mark the writing implement 
with which you write. So the graves inside are both made. They both have the pencil boxes on top. So some people will say, oh, this was uh, Kamali was Jamali's wife. I mean, you know, yeah, the same way Vishnu was Shiva's wife, right? Um, so, but, so, it, so it's just fascinating to me architecturally as well. How this building belies what you think of it. It gives you both the dome and the flat surface. Both the sort of pencil box and the page. And, and doesn't sort of either choose or ask us to choose between the two. But sort of says it can go both ways or more than one way, certainly. And so for me, the Dandas and these are revered sites. In fact, almost all the stories I've been telling you about are, are uh, stories that have to deal with, that, do, that deal with um, gods, goddesses, mythologies that are revered. So we are not talking about ideas that are you know, shunned or have been shunned. These are ideas that are held up as ideals. So these are ideas that we should aspire towards. How they have been then denuded of that aspirational value and then we're told, oh, no, no, get the simple answer. That disjunction, I have no idea how that happens. So Madhavi has said that this book is actually a counter to the Swachh Bharat. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. So it's, it's, this is the messy project that uh, we all love. Well, I mean, the thing about Swachh Bharat, as uh, I keep saying, other than wanting to know where those taxes go, right? Because we still have a Swachh Bharat set on every bill. But anyway, other than that, it's very clear to us by now that it has nothing to do with clean roads or providing toilets or anything of the kind. Because one inch of rain in Delhi and already all the roads will get clogged and everything. Right? So it has nothing to do with cleaning the roads. It has everything to do with cleaning the narrative that is India. It has everything to do with saying the, in, the Indian story is one story and that's the story of upper caste male Hinduism. That's it. And anybody outside that is dirty and needs to be purged. So this idea of swachhata, which on the one hand we all love, right? Who wouldn't love a clean road? And so it's a very smart way to get us all on board. But once you're on board, they'll say, ha ha, well, they won't say it. But the implication is, ha ha. We're not talking about roads any longer, we're talking about Muslims and Dalits and women and all the respectively menstruating women um, and all those dirty people who have to be purged. And so this idea of swachhata, and let me tell you, speaking as someone who is absolutely anal about cleanliness, is a very dangerous idea. Intellectually and politically and ethically. It's always been the trope of fascist Absolutely. Uh, authoritarian uh, regimes. Exactly. Neatness. So please give up your attachment to neatness, embrace these shredded yeah. pages. And that <laughs> shows so that's going to be tough. <laughs> but with that, I'm going to throw this open uh, for comments, <laughs> questions, uh, <coughs> stories. Your book is very interesting and there are many different uh, topics that sort of uh, approaches desire in very different ways. Um, to me, what is probably like two thoughts that are coming into my head is that it also this whole uh, strictness around, uh, you know, trying to control desire or label desire uh, reminds me of the whole 1984, the George Orwellian world where love is actually a crime. Like you cannot be like sentimental or emotional. There's this whole boundary against, you know, I mean, the limitations against how people can interact with each other. The other thing, like, what I wonder reading your book was also that when we look at the West, you are mostly referring to the biblical West, the uh, Judeo biblical West. So I was just wondering, but you know, the influences that we are seeing today, what, what could be the causes? What could be the reason? Is it only the influence of the British Raj or is there something more to it? Like, why have we come where we have come? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I think the answer is never simple, right? I keep sort of joking. I wish it were as easy as saying the British are to blame for everything. They blame maybe for 99.9%. But not everything. Um, no, because I think what they did in a, you know, they, they're not fools. They were not fools. They may be now, but they were not fools. Um, and what they did very clearly in an attempt to rule India, was to take on board um, those parts of our tradition that most closely echoed their own and to make them the majority opinions. So for instance, they found an absolute treasure trove in the caste system, right? In the Hindu caste system. And you know, as I, I, if you read the introduction, you will see that story that I've narrated um, about in Kerala, right? And in Kerala, as all the fault lines are coming to the fore now in Shabdi Mara, 
uh, Kerala Brahmins, who are, by the way, the ones in charge of Shalimala, are absolutely, historically awful, repressive people. And they treat their women worse than anybody else. And so the Brahmin women are sent out for a walk. And if the shadow of a lower caste person falls across their thing, um, they have a helper with them that has to measure the distance between the woman and the lower caste person. And if it's more than a particular thing, then she has to go have a ritual cleansing bath in the air. Those kinds of oppressive caste structures they picked up on with <coughs> greed. Because that's a very easy way to say pollution. Very easy way to pick up notions of purity and impurity. Because actually, if they looked at Vedic religions of uh, Islamic uh, iterations in India in terms of Sufism, they couldn't find those many stories of purity. So they picked up via the caste system, that was their sort of inroad, and by taking the Manaswati as being their, their version of the Bible, they were able to elevate certain strands of Vedic Brahmanism into something that would define all of India. And those languages are the languages we have continued to speak as they are wedded to a certain kind of sort of Victorian prudery, no doubt. Um, but, but that's how the language is fairly carefully crafted. So no, it's not like we were entirely innocent and wonderful and then were despoiled. Yeah, I think we that's important to we I think that's important to remember Absolutely. as well. So not to say that oh, all the uh, because sometimes you know we might say, Oh, that beautiful Indian past, you know, if only we can yeah. go back. <laughs> I think don't think that was the case at all. I, I think if we think of that beautiful Indian past as being pure. We run the risk of talking about rhinoplasty, right? Ganesha is an example of rhinoplasty. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, uh, whatever, you know, all the stuff that the other uh, uh, people claim that the Hindu civilization was so superior. I think that's very dangerous for them again. Uh, we have to think about our own um, um, our own role that we played in coming where we are today. What are the repercussions of taking impurity really seriously, especially in a caste society? Um, uh, given uh, especially uh, how uh, the revelation in impurity is precisely what has condemned the Vedic communities uh, uh, and historically led to their marginalization, right? So the Vedic communities are thought to be impure, are, are precisely marked by excess transgression, all of those words that we, uh, that we think are great with desire, uh, but as soon as it's embodied, Precisely, this is embodied in a body, um, uh, allow for various kinds of violation, right? So, how do we uh, check on the idea of impurity, uh, especially as it is historically in this very country given to uh, impunity with regards to violation? Um, this becomes especially true because, as we now realize, that even in the Sabri Mala case, uh, there is the Mala Araya community which is the Adivasis of the region who have said that these are, this was actually a temple that is now being Vedic, uh, taken over by Vedic priests, etc. And it happened at the set of particular time. So what, and so therefore there is for me in the Mala Raya uh, uh, imagination, the giving up of, because like the indigenous don't actually contribute to caste society, the, the, the outside of the caste society through which we could actually think about desire and what it could do to us. <laughs> Uh, but also because one thing that we think about as the the half, and we are thinking about the con the constant half widows of Kashmir, which isn't a great image to bring up. It is also a half more than one, less than one. Or I'm thinking about what Ambedkar thinks about various Dalit women as surplus women to Brahmin men. So there is there is a way in which we might want to think about uh, impurity not only with its relationship to um, desire, but also impunity and violation. The second I was thinking about was, um, and precisely because that chapter of psychoanalysis is so interesting, um, is that are constraints always social? Um, and sexuality and desire personal. Uh, and if that is not the case, in what, have, what would an archive around consensual <laughs> constraints or limits that allow us to kind of think about uh, Sexuality not always as excess, but also limit, as always designing limit, uh, might also kind of, uh, might be interesting. Um, <laughs> and finally, uh, just in continuation with that. Um, I'm thinking if you would actually thought of the mathematical idea of identity, 
because in mathematics, identity is a set that doesn't, uh, even as things change within it, it doesn't change the identity of the of the set. Uh, so if if there was a way in mathematics for us to actually get over our relationship between desire like self and identity as stable and immobile, if we were to think mathematically of identity as one in which various kinds of things might happen, but the identity remains the same, right? So I could desire 10,000 people, but on legality, I could say my identity is this, which doesn't take away from anything that's happening internally. So I was thinking if we were to actually get rid of and especially because now readings from Foucault uh, reveal the fact that he was actually thinking of identity in the mathematical sense. Uh, and might actually be interesting to actually push the idea of mathematics there. I'll shut up. No, no mathematics again. I know I can't do it. Um, let me, impurity and impunity, let's just sort of begin with that. Um, I think it behooves those of us who are sheltered by the notion of purity to actually embrace the idea of impure. So I think the onus of embracing impurity has to be um, on those of us who have in fact been sheltered by the opposite. So my, my um, animus really in terms of desire is against the idea of purity. Um, and impurity becomes then just a way of life rather than something that you actually have to embrace. It becomes a fact of everyday life. And this goes to, goes to your second question about the um, is desire internal and constrained external? And, and, and I think as you yourself know the answer to that, the answer is no. Right? Desire is extremely external. Um, it is not only sort of modeled for us externally, um, constrained for us externally, but we also act it out externally. I mean, you know, just look at the sort of um, ever bigger weddings that go on uh, in and around not only North India now, but everywhere really, um, in the world. And, you know, now gay people also say, well, we also want to get married yeah? because we also want to show our desire uh, publicly. So desire is extremely external. And where that link between or the limit or the connection between the internal and the external comes, I cannot uh, even begin to say. And I don't want to necessarily either. But there is a certain, uh, there is no doubt. And again, whether you think about Lady Chatterley's lover or whether you think about any of the stories that we have grown up with, um, whether or not we are uh, students of the humanities, there is always something transgressive about desire. Which is why, of course, we have in our country that weird phrase that no one outside the Indian subcontinent understands, which is the phrase love marriage. Mm -hmm. Right? The idea that you might not actually, in fact, have your desire line up in a way that can be arranged. That there is something about it that is transgressive, and you know, as well as anybody else, that love marriage in India tends to be almost code for intercaste or interreligious or um, or interregional or whatever it is, some kind of alliance that does not meet with societal approval. So there is a way in which desire is always acting on these fault lines of inside and out, uh, approval, approvals and disapproval. Um, and of course, the classic example of desire that is absolutely transgressive and absolutely abiding by constraints is SNM. Right? That you have sadomasochism that is very, very clear that you have a safe word, that you know when to stop, and that when you say that word, that means stop. And any violation of that is a violation of the entire code of SNM. And we all have these codes. So there is no necessary opposition between transgression and constraint either. As there is no necessary opposition between our position in life, gendered, sexualized, casted, uh, religious, and the way in which we desire. Because desire, and this goes back to my idea of impurity, if I can use a synonym for that, desire is always politically incorrect. We might choose to make it appear politically correct, but it really isn't. And um, there's also a very uh, interesting chapter on Marx and then Operation Majinu. Yeah. And these are these words that have now come, love jihad, uh, Operation Majinu. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, these are also you know, completely threatened by uh, different kinds of impurity. Well, and, and the park is a perfect example. Is it private? Is it public? Is it inside? Is it outside? Is it, you know, are you private if you're on a bench or private behind a bush and public on a bench? I mean, what, what is happening? All this is the same space. 
And in fact, and, you know, we don't have to go in there, but as you know, one of the criticisms of the case mounted against 377 and the court is that it won the right for uh, consenting sex in private, in a country where the spaces of privacy are actually few and far between. And so we actually lost a lot, I think, with that embrace of the idea of privacy. Yeah, go ahead. So I wanted to tell you that in your thought, thought about the brain being and all the desire, as well as the point that you just made about identity. So in uh, with very basically in our college, the court said that the brain creates a narrative for us within which we live, and which is why most of us tend to be less accepting of ideas that challenge that narrative because it's difficult for us to cope with it. So in many ways, if we have an idea that if our brain didn't have that identity for us, we would, with each new idea, have to shift our identity or our story or our story or narrative of ourselves. And so, in many ways, I think there's a conflict between the desire in our brain for things and then that narrative that we want to maintain within it. So, even while as individuals you might want to uh, be different from whatever the social structure imposes on you, yeah. there's that in the inner narrative or that conflict in your brain to stick to it. I think what you've perfectly described is the way in which we live, without doubt, and that's absolutely right. What um, endlessly puzzles me is that that's actually not the way in which we live, right? We like Gaja Kaharwa one day and we don't the other day. Or we like men one day and we don't the other day. And so where, what, where, and why is this narrative that we have to like the same things all the time or dislike the same things all the time or have to be fixed in any way all the time? And so that sense of, and, and again, let me sort of clarify, this doesn't mean that we don't lead fairly boring lives, right? Maybe many of our lives are fairly boring. But to be attached to fixity, so much so that we cannot entertain the possibility of change, that's where the danger comes. So you can live the same boring life and do the, eat the same boring food and have sex with the same boring person, hopefully not, whatever, for the rest of your life. But to assume that that is somehow your destiny or that is the way the world should be, that's where the problem arises because then it becomes prescriptive. It becomes a way of telling everyone this is the way you have to live or ought to live. And that's where the danger is. And the exciting part is that nobody actually quite lives like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So your desires are always in excess of the regulations. That's right. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, agree that uh, there has been limited discourse on the complicated uh, inter intersection or conflict between uh, desire and disability. So, uh, while you were research researching for the book, did you explore this domain as well? No. In fact, one of the um, towards the end of my introduction, I say that I can actually imagine twenty other chapters. So there's nothing special about the topics that I have picked for this book because my whole point is that I want to pick everyday subjects and everyday matters. And certainly disability is something that we encounter on a daily basis and it is something that certainly affects the way in which we think about desire. So perhaps in another version of this book, I will think about that. But just sort of very briefly, um, the idea that um, if you are sort of physically or emotionally or mentally handicapped, that your relation to desire is fundamentally different from an able-bodied person, I think is an absurd idea, an absurd phenomenon. Um, but, you know, and then there's all this work been done about, you know, skin hunger and, and these people sort of, people who want to have sex and are not, and have not been, for various reasons, disability being prime among them. Um, I think it's a very rich vein to tap into. So that's said maybe in another version of this book. But there's a lot of work that is also being done now, a lot of writing is also, and I think that one of the things that we learn from, uh, you know, uh, desire uh, around people with disability is at precisely how completely diverse it can be, you know, and uh, uh, even sexual desire, how different it can be. So I think that really is a lesson. So if you are really looking for diversity, we really need to look at, you know, people with disability and what they have to say about desire, not just sexual desire, but different kinds of desire. If there are no hands, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Madhvi to uh, conclude our session this evening with a reading from the book.
Okay, now I don't know which one to pick because the pressure of being the final thing is always hard. What about the fun? <laughs> fun, kites, and yeah. I think I'm going to actually do grandma. Yeah, I just thought that, that if I say something, she would disagree with it. <laughs> and, and come up with something good. Knows how to get, <laughs> knows how to, get to, me, to agree. Um, this doesn't mean, by the way, if you have questions, you can still ask even after the reading. It, it doesn't mean it's the, it's the be all and all. So there's a chapter on grammar, um, which is the fifth chapter in the book. Um, and it's a chapter that might sort of, you might want to say, oh my god, I, oh my, I don't want to think about grammar, too many traumatic lessons about English language teachers in class 6, 7, and 8, or whatever it is, um, and, and I don't want to think about grammar, but a big part of my um, argument is that the languages that we use to speak about desire really make a difference to how we think about desire. Um, and so this is just an attempt, and as I said again, these are only teasers I'm giving you, so this is just an attempt to give you a teaser about how grammar plays such an important role in how we think about ourselves and how we think about desires. Um, and every chapter in this book has an epigraph, and I haven't read out the epigraphs to the other chapters, but I will read out the epigraph to this chapter because it's um, from a poem by Kamala Das, who is, as many of you know, a wonderful, wonderful uh, poet. And this is a poem called An Introduction. I am Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. Don't write in English, they said. English is not your mother tongue. Why not leave me alone, critics, friends, visiting cousins, every one of you? Why not let me speak in any language I like? The language I speak becomes mine. Its distortions, its queernesses, all mine, mine alone. So that's the epigraph. In 1976, when I was five years old, I had a double hernia operation. I remember vividly the many moments of intense discomfort, the multiple trips to the hospital, and the slow and painful recovery after the operation. On one of my early visits to the hospital before the surgery was scheduled, the doctor took my mother aside to express his doubts over my diagnosis. He said it was quite unusual almost unheard of, for such a young girl to be diagnosed with a double hernia. There was no question that I needed the operation since I had pieces of my inside spilling out on a regular basis and needing to be pushed back in again. But his theory was that rather than having a double or even a single hernia, I had undescended testicles that needed to be removed. I did not hear about this counter-diagnosis until 35 years later. My mother had been unnerved by the conversation with the doctor in 1976, and she was even more traumatized when a well-meaning nurse told her to make sure that word of my condition did not get around for fear that I would be kidnapped by Hitler's before the operation had taken place and made one of their own. There are only two areas in which gender plays a defining role in our lives. So first is in determining the identity of living beings, both human and animal. And the second is in defining the rules of grammar. Indeed, Sanskrit grammar texts like Panini's Ashtadhyayi and Patanjali's Mahabhyasha in the Brahmanical tradition and Buddhist and Jain texts written in Pali all assume that animate and inanimate people, objects and concepts have gender. These grammar books make clear that the way in which we think of gender in language affects the way in which we think of gender in persons. The same term, napunsak, is used in these texts to describe the state of being neuter in person <coughs> as well as the state of being neuter in grammar. From at least the 3rd century BC onwards, the mark connecting biological and grammatical gender in Sanskrit and Pali traditions has been that of the linga, Shiva's palace. Those of us who have suffered through classes in Sanskrit will know that the linga is the category into which different words are placed. Stri linga for feminine words, pu linga for masculine words, and napunsak linga for neuter words. If you put the wrong word in the wrong gendered category, then your sentence construction is simply wrong. The linga separates man and woman and neuter in person just as ruthlessly as it separates the masculine, feminine, and neuter case and grammar. 
The dilemma with which my mother grappled in 1976 then was both a grammatical and an existential one. She was faced with the possibility of my sliding from the feminine to the neuter case in both body and language. My seemingly female body, she was told, might not belong in the grammatical category of the feminine. Thank you, Madhuri. That's a great show to end up and thank you. And we will let Gita Mishra have the last word. Yeah. Is that it? Okay, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone for coming. This was Kriya's first briefing evening. And thank you, Madhuri and Shwini. It couldn't have been more apt for many reasons. Especially because at Kriya, we are trying to have more discussions, debates on the affirmative side of our lives. We spend so much of our time talking about violence, suffering, harm. We try to push for more conversations about desire, love, sexuality, pleasure. And especially for, the, for encouraging all of us that are feminists to spend as much time talking and developing a language on pleasure and desire. Because we have spent so much time developing language on violence and suffering. So thanks so much. It could have been a better evening for us and Priya as well as hopefully everyone. This is the first and we hope you join us for many more. Madhvi's book is on sale outside and everything that she's read should just encourage us to buy not one but many copies and Madhvi will be signing her book. Thanks so much everyone. Thank you. So, uh, how does the, uh, the origin of the book, where does that come from? Well, I mean, it's interesting that um, people look at me and see that I'm Indian and the book is called A History of Desire in India. So they automatically assume that this is why I'm writing about it because I'm from here. And that's part of the reason. But I was never trained as a scholar of Indian history or literature or mythology or anything of the kind. But what I find my interest is... My scholarly interest has always been queer theory, has always been thinking about desire that exceeds boundaries, that spills over categories. And there is no place in the world that I know of in which those categories are more excessive, more unruly and messy than on the Indian subcontinent. And so that's how I got around to thinking about the relationship between queer theory as a set of ideas around desire and the ways in which they get acted out or played out on the Indian subcontinent historically. And so it's not that this is a story, that this is a series of stories about um, India that is sort of um, the only way in which one can see things. These are a series of stories about India that are one among a multiple way series of uh, stories about India. And I just wanted to sort of put front and center the idea of desire and the way in which desire spills out in all these stories. So what I really liked is that how each chapter starts with a concept, with one thing that you define. Yeah. And in within that series, you've also mentioned that how these could look very different in another set of right. uh, concepts that you could talk about. Exactly. So was there anything in the in amongst the concepts that was very difficult for you to articulate? The most difficult chapter for me, by far. I still have bad dreams when I think about it. The most difficult chapter was the one on yoga. Yeah. Not only because I, I'm not particularly fond of yoga, I don't do yoga, that's, that's a different thing. But the amount of literature there is on yoga and the number of battle lines there are around yoga is incredible. So I had to actually really read through tons of the literature, talk to many, many practicing yogis and yoginis, talk to many teachers and really try and make sure that I was not treading on any minds that I did not want to step on. Um, and so that was a very difficult terrain to map, especially because yoga, and it shouldn't be because yoga is one of those things that apparently makes you feel calm and centered and grounded. But yoga is one of these things that has acquired such political weight in these last four and a half years that, as you know, the government of India now is sort of sending yoga instructors all over the world to disseminate yoga. And you might, might have heard this too. They invited applications for yoga teachers and turned down every single Muslim who applied. So this idea of yoga as being a Hindu, purely Hindu spiritual space is one that is so um, repeatedly denied and refuted by the literature of it that it seemed inevitable to me to talk about it. To talk about that relation between this desire for stillness and purity on the one hand and the messy history of desire that informs yoga on the other. 
it, it was a difficult topic to do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can you imagine. Went a lot of information. Yeah. And what in those series would you say that was the most fun part, which, which you could relate a lot? The most fun chapter. Yeah. Um, I loved them all. I mean, even the yoga chapter I loved, though it was so difficult. I really loved them all. I think maybe my favorite one um, might have been the one on Dargas, because as I said to me, that is the Delhi chapter for me. And I'm sort of very deeply invested in Delhi because to me, this is a space of such syncretism. It's a space of sort of multiple religions, multiple desires, multiple sexualities coming together and historically. But I also love the chapter on sexology, which is my last chapter, um, because for me, I made, that was where I made most clear the conversation that's always going on in my mind and in the book between a certain kind of um, Western understanding of queer theory on the one hand and certain um, realities around desire on the other hand. And putting those two in conversation with each other was just exhilarating for me. And that happened throughout the book, but I think I was able to do it most openly by talking about Foucault and history of sexuality in that last chapter. That's very interesting. And I the last concluding question, your remarks on the rethinking place and how was the interaction today? It was absolutely wonderful. I'm starting with the title itself. I think calling something Rethink Evenings is wonderful. It again puts front and center your politics, your investment in saying, uh, we really want to hear fresh ideas, new ideas, not the same old regurgitation of what we already know. Uh, but really trying to put a different slant on it. And to me, that is that embodies the queerness of desire, because queerness is everything that is not straight and not narrow. And that's what I'm invested in. Thank you so much. Good luck Thanks. to you. Thank you.